Welcome to Industry and Intelligence. While I know we all wish we could be in person today, I'm glad that we are still able to bring you important educational discussions, no matter what the circumstances. To say we've experienced significant change and challenges in the winter outdoor industry in the past 10 months would be the understatement of the century. This past year has been marked by real individual loss and suffering. And while I do not want to minimize the pain that many are experiencing, at the same time, I have great optimism that we can create positive change. As an industry, we will find the opportunities for growth and innovation and celebrate the silver linings no matter how small. As we look to the future of our industry, we must support and challenge one another to be better as individuals, businesses, and as a community. Transformation starts with embracing the opportunity and having the wherewithal to do things differently. We all play an important role and the opportunities for change are abundant. The opportunity to innovate and modernize our businesses has never been greater and more apparent. COVID has forced us all to examine our surroundings and adapt our businesses. The new normal is the new way of doing business. We have the opportunity to speak to a new consumer, to welcome more diverse participants to the winter outdoor community. With non-whites and Hispanics being a majority of people under age 16, we can't afford not to. We have a business imperative to ingrain inclusion in every facet of our business. We also have the opportunity to address climate change and secure the future of our industry. We depend on snow and it's our job to protect it. Like inclusion, this is a business priority. Each of us has the responsibility to take advantage of the roadmaps, guidance, and resources to effectively address this issue. Between COVID, inclusion, and climate, it's easy to feel overwhelmed and powerless. But powerless is a choice. We each have the capacity to build a path forward, and we have the ability to create significant change together as a community. SIA is here to support you and the winter outdoor industry in creating positive change, to help set goals, provide resources, and challenge you to be part of the solution. No matter where you are on your journey, the opportunity to lean into change has never been greater. Our keynote speaker embodies the importance of tackling adversity, setting ambitious goals, and creating change. Gus Kenworthy is one of a kind, not just for his skiing, but for his personality, determination, advocacy, and heart. Born in the UK, Gus's family moved to Tyurad, Colorado when he was two and began skiing shortly after. He picked up his first sponsor at the age of 16, and at 27 years old, he continues to push the sport and establish new boundaries. His dedication to his craft established him as one of the top park skiers in the world, bringing home the silver medal from Sochi and one of a select few athletes that consistently makes the podium in slope style, half pipe, and big air events. Beyond his athletic proudness, Gus has become a symbol of hope and acceptance, transcending boundaries and overcoming obstacles. Gus's talent has no boundaries through his success as an Olympic medalist in skiing, his efforts in activism, and overall star power. Gus Kenworthy has established himself as a global icon. Hosting the conversation with Gus is my friend, Michael Spencer. Michael is the managing director at One Sports Entertainment and is Gus's agent and good friend. Please welcome Gus Kenworthy. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for having us here at the Winter Outdoor Retailer. And uh, once again, I'm Michael Spencer. I'll be uh, asking our guest right now, Gus Kenworthy, Olympic silver medalist, LGBTQ activist, and all around pretty amazing human. So Gus, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm <laughs> doing well, thanks. Uh, normally we get to talk a lot, but it's, uh, this is a little bit different for us. So it's, yeah, I was going to say a long good. time no talk. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> well, good. Michael and I speak every single day. That is very true. I'll um, accept your apologies, um, everybody. Well, let's dive into it. Um, the first thing we want to talk about, really, and, and kind of the, the impetus of all of this is about this last season, what it looked like, um, both for you as an athlete, but you as just as a human and everything else. So, you know, let's start with, you know, the beginning of 2020 and 
what was that like for you? And then the changes that started to take place going into March? Um, I mean, 2020 was really a roller coaster for me, for sure. Uh, from a ski standpoint, the pandemic kind of hit toward the end of the regular competition season. So it almost felt like we dodged a bullet a little bit. Um, and, and the beginning of the year actually went really well for me. I had a second place at the Dew Tour and I won the last World Cup of the year in Calgary and was kind of looking forward to spring training and, and summer training and all of that got put on hold um, because the whole world got put on hold. Um, but it was definitely, it was definitely an interesting year. And I remember not knowing how long it was really going to last or what it really meant. And I had, um, some sponsors and, 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 and a lot of obligations and stuff that were, uh, set to, I can't talk. Um, I had a lot of commitments and things on my calendar that all got canceled and things that I was looking forward to, including um, a hosting gig for NBC for Summer Olympics. And I had some sponsors cut pay and I really didn't know what was going to happen with the rest of the year. And so I was kind of just trying to take it uh, one day at a time and had some health scares with my family. And uh, it, was, it was really just kind of like a lot all at once. Um, and then throughout the rest of the year, I, I tried to find ways to keep myself busy and uh, keep myself fulfilled creatively and try and train without being able to get on snow. And I had a knee surgery. Um, so I've kind of just been rehabilitating from all of that. And then this year has had so much else going on with um, Black Lives Matter. And I mean, really, really just a, a whole lot that I feel like I've tried to sort of sink my teeth into and get behind. Uh, we want to uh, get, yeah. We want to get into some of the Black Lives Matter here in a little bit, but one thing um, going back to the to the, your competition, um, one thing I know is that at least you did have a first um, on multiple fronts, right? What was it? <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's pretty important to p point out that you had uh, the first World Cup win for Team GB, and it was your first World Cup for Team GB now that you're skiing for them. Yeah, so... Um... Like a year and a half ago, I switched from the U.S. team to the British Olympic team to try and go to my third and likely final Olympics for Team GB. And I was born in the U.K. My mom's British, and it's sort of always been an option and decided this time around that I was going to do that. And um, yeah, this year in Calgary, I competed in my first World Cup for Great Britain and won, and it was... Great Britain's first World Cup win in half pipe, which is pretty cool. Um, but it also was it was uh, kind of like particularly special because when I made the move, I said that the reason I was doing it is uh, to kind of do something special as a tribute to my mom. And she's been my number one fan and she's been super supportive and she's worn the stars and stripes and cheered USA for me uh, during two Olympic cycles and she's not American. And I felt like this would be a, a wonderful thing to do for her. And when I did that, there was a lot of people saying that the real reason I did it is because I'm not good enough to make the U S team or cause I uh, can't compete anymore or that I'll, I won't be on podiums anymore anyway. And so it, it kind of was nice to kind of silently put a middle finger to all those people and, get a second at the do tour and win the world cup and show that that's not even at all the reason. That's amazing. Yeah, no, I think it, uh, you definitely put a statement on your season, uh, before it came to an end so quickly. So that was awesome. You have obviously been an activist in many ways. And I mean, and have had a lot of other first, I mean, just both through your ski career and everything else. And then, you know, going to 2015 when you came out, um, and through that, I think you've really shown what a leader you are in, in a lot of disciplines and roles that you take with your life. Um, jumping into this past June, um, when Black Lives Matter really came about, you took a pretty good stand on that. Can you tell us, you know, what was your reasoning behind that and how do you feel about that now? Um, well, how I feel is that Black Lives Matter and Black Lives still matter. And 
I think that my eyes were kind of just opened to an issue that I didn't really realize our nation was facing. Obviously, I understood that there was racism, but I didn't realize how deep rooted it was and how severe it was. And I feel like Trump's presidency gave room for all of these people to come up and stand up and show their true colors and, and uh, get to try and mask it as patriotism or anything else that they are trying to say. But in fact, it's just blatant racism. And I don't know. I think I didn't really realize that that existed to that degree. And so when my eyes were open to that, I felt like I couldn't sit by. And I feel like it all essentially comes from a place of privilege. And I realized that I am like at the top of the pyramid in terms of privilege and I'm a cisgender white man and I'm good looking and good at a sport. And it's like, it's sort of irresponsible and um, reflects badly on, on me and on so many other people if I don't use my platform for good. And I feel like that's something that I've realized long ago. And I feel like I realized it when I was coming out and I wanted to be a role model, but I didn't really realize what a role model meant. And it's a sort of interesting thing to try and navigate because I came out and then I'm suddenly, at least in some way, shape or form, a spokesperson for the LGBTQ community and for my own experience and for gay athletes. But prior to coming out, I didn't have any gay friends. I had never really understood what it meant to be an out athlete, uh, an out gay man. And so it was really, it it was just a a really interesting thing to try and figure out how to be the best representation I could be without having any experience or any know-how. And, um, uh, and I, and I, I tried my best and I feel like that was something that I knew I wanted to do because I knew that there was people watching me because of my platform. And there was a lot of other kids in sport that would be going through the same thing or a similar thing, or even if they weren't in sport, if they were just from a small town or a closed minded community or a religious family. And I wanted to try and help those people and show that there was um, a path forward when maybe it felt like there wasn't. And I think that that role model position is something that I've really taken to heart and in more ways than just being an LGBTQ advocate. And I feel like with the Black Lives Matter, it was the same thing. Like I have this huge platform and I've been given incredible opportunities um, and I, I can't and, and won't and shouldn't sit by and let injustices happen. And I need to use that privilege and that platform to try and speak up for those who have been disenfranchised and try and amplify Black voices and queer voices and not be complicit in allowing them to be silenced. I think that's amazing. I mean, <clears throat> you're extremely admirable in what you do and, and things that you just said, how you took on, upon the role to really learn and explore. I know for myself, I mean, you taught me a lot through this whole thing too and, and allowed me to experience it a little bit through you. And I think the fact that you take it to your platforms the way you do and take on that responsibility is something that more of us could do. Um, are there things that you could see with inside the industry of snow sports or even outdoor that could be useful during these times um, between the lessons that you've learned this year and stuff to be a lot more inclusive? Yeah. Well, I mean like a huge thing, I think for, for any industry, but for the snow sports industry or for just the outdoor sports industry in general um, it's, as I just said, it's about amplifying disenfranchised voices. So rather than asking me or asking any white person at the company, like, how can we do better to serve um, this particular minority or whatever it is? It's like, ask that person, like everyone should have a seat at the table. So there should be um, more diversity at the company, at um, on the marketing team, within the brand, Uh, in terms of the athletes that are sponsored and the people that play roles within the company, it needs to be diverse and inclusive. And by doing that and having that team of people be diverse and inclusive, the outreach from the company and the messaging and the branding is going to inherently be more inclusive. And I think that that's what it needs to be. That's amazing. 
Yeah, I, I would definitely agree. And I think, you know, having someone like you, though, to start speaking upon this within this group and, and amongst many groups has, has been a very, you know, positive outlook on it and, and seeing you being able to experience it from a personal standpoint is pretty amazing. Thanks, Michael. Through, through 2020 and obviously the things that we're talking about and Black Lives Matter and stuff, how was it on you personally, like trying to balance you know, obviously we were all in quarantine for a period of time and locked down, knowing that you're going to compete, being this activist, how do you balance all of that? And how did you handle it yourself and, and, and deal with the pressures over, you know, over the course of this last year of, you know, people not being able to get out as much and, and trying to find a way to stay positive and those kind of things? I mean, it was honestly a struggle. I, wish that I could be like, oh, it was super easy. And I just did this and I got through it. But like, I definitely struggled with depression this year. Um, more than I have in a really long time, more than I have since I was in the closet. And uh, I'm used to being around a lot of people. And I definitely feed off of people's energy. And I love being surrounded by people, whether it's for a dinner or a party or whatever it is. And that obviously wasn't happening at all this year. And so it was really hard for me to be alone with my dog and uh, my boyfriend was working from his own place. And so we were kind of apart during the day. And I feel really lucky that I had him and had someone at night to hang out with and chat with and watch TV with, but it was still all day long. I was by myself and I'm not trying to say that my situation was terrible because I know a lot of people had it much worse than I did, but, um, but it, it's still difficult being in isolation and I struggled with it for sure. And I think that, um, it was daunting thinking about how I was going to be training or how far behind I was going to be falling in skiing. And I would see that people in different countries, like in New Zealand had no cases and their mountain was open and people were able to train there. And so it was hard not to spiral thinking about that huge advantage that they had or people in Europe and different countries in Norway, whatever, or Scandinavia, and, and were able to ski and I'm at home in LA and can only leave to walk my dog and go to the grocery store. Um, so it was, it was pretty tough and training from home was, was difficult and has been difficult. And I feel like I don't yet know what, uh, it will equate to because I haven't really had an opportunity to get back on snow, but I'm actually going this next week to Colorado to train and compete at the X games. And it's been a long break, uh, since basically the pandemic started in like February, March, I haven't skied more than four days. I went to Europe in October, but I had just had a knee surgery. So my days were limited to about four runs per day. Um, so I feel like I haven't skied in a year, um, really, which is, it's a little crazy and a little scary, um, but there's still plenty of time before the 2022 games. And I feel really confident that we will get through this pandemic and looking forward to getting vaccinated at some point and getting back to training more normally. Um, and then in terms of my sanity, I, I picked up guitar during the, the pandemic and I would spend like two hours a day pretty diligently um, practicing and trying to learn. And it was a huge savior for me. And I started songwriting um, and it's just been something that has really, really helped me and made me feel fulfilled creatively and kept me busy and kept me sane. And um, yeah, that's kind of it. That's I've also great. drank too much and done other things <laughs> to cope. I'm sure we all have. There's no question about that. I don't know. Maybe we should put you on the spot and have you play a little piece for us, but I won't do that to you unless you really want to. <laughs> no, we're not. I'm like, no, I would never as I pull my guitar up. Um, but no, I'm not going to do that. Um, this year in particular, your schedule, as I know all too well, has been extremely fluid to say the least. Um, Events have already been canceled. They're trying to reschedule. Um, fortunately, the one constant you have is X Games. How are you, you know, what are you doing to maintain a focus of knowing that you have these competitions at some point in time, or hopefully you do, and, you know, maintaining that focus, but without, you know, getting your sights set on a certain date and then that let down and then having to build back up? How are you uh, getting through all that? Um it's a good question. When I have an answer for you, I'll uh, let you know. But I, I think I've kind of been hoping for the best and preparing for the worst. 
I think that's kind of the only approach you can really have. I feel like if I am expecting an event to be canceled and I've kind of like written it off in my mind and then it were to happen, I would not be in the right headspace for it. Um, and so it's, I feel like it's easier to prepare for something and be ready for something and then have it not happen. And it's a little disappointing, but then kind of like move on and understand that that's kind of just the trend at the moment and the way that things are going because of factors that are out of anybody's control. Um, so I've been kind of trying to just stay as ready as I can be and, and hope that uh, like X Games, for example, is going to happen and hope that world championships are going to happen and, and try and get myself in the right headspace for it. And if it turns out that they don't happen and they're canceled, then it's like, okay, well, that's something that I can't change. And it's like, it is a factor that you can't change. So it's, it's um, I don't know, it's been really weird. It's just, you just have to be adaptable. And I feel like I've been um, kind of like preconditioned for that. Like slope style skiing is just inherently about adaptability and showing up to a course and the course is completely different than any other course. And you have to kind of adapt to it and figure out what run you're going to do. And, and um, so I feel like free skiers are just good at adapting and good at um, being dealing with whatever's thrown at us. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's been, it's been, it's been really interesting for sure. I feel like the other thing is that my schedule is normally so that, I'm just traveling all the time. I'm flying all the time, whether it's for training or for a ski competition or an appearance or a speaking engagement. And then cut to 2020 where I basically didn't fly anywhere since March. And it's, it's weird and it is difficult to adjust to something totally new, but you kind of have to try and find the silver linings and things. And it's also like, it did suck, but I also had to have knee surgery and it's like, well, it's so nice that I'm able to be home during this time and have the surgery and be able to recover. And like, I would never have this time to spend in my apartment. And I really love this apartment. And like, I'm so grateful to have all this time with my dog. Cause normally I'd get a little bit of time here and there with her and then someone would have to watch her and then I'd be flying. And so there's always, there's always positives. And I feel like it helps to focus on those and meditation has really helped me. And I meditate every day. Um, recommend it to anybody. <laughs> Is there a particular app or anything you use that people should that you would recommend that's made it a little bit. Yeah, creative. actually I use the calm app. This isn't like a pl paid plug. <laughs> um, I use, the, I use the calm app and for anybody that is thinking about getting into meditation, it's actually really great because they have a 30 day intro to meditation. And I did that even though I had already started meditating and it's really, really great. They're like 12 minutes each. Um, it's pretty easy to carve out that time. And I feel like if you did that and did that consistently for a month, you would, probably be pretty hooked and want to continue doing it. Um, at least for me, I feel like I noticed a, a difference for sure. And I, I think it really helps. That's awesome. I mean, it's something I should try to do. So hopefully that's a good tip for everyone else listening right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, speaking of travel, I would assume that uh, one thing that eats you up though, with not traveling is your status. Well, <laughs> uh, also not a paid plug, but United airlines, uh, didn't do any status last year. They just matched from the previous year. And I don't know what they're going to do this year, but given the fact that the pandemic's not under control, I imagine they'll do something similar. So not too much of a concern. I just had to give you a little grief on that one. Um, let's go to your yeah. knee real quickly. Since you did have surgery this year during the pandemic and stuff, I would, and knowing that you've had other surgeries in the past, how different was that? And how was it like going to the hospital during the pandemic and having that procedure? And what was your level of you know, being okay with having to go to hospitals and then also the, the recovery, you know, whether it was hands-on or not. Yeah. Um, it was definitely a really different experience than any other surgeries I've had, not only because you're wearing a mask the whole time, but there's all this COVID protocol and uh, you have to have a COVID screening prior to going to get the surgery. And then again, after the surgery. Um, so I, that was actually my first COVID test was a drive-through testing um, prior to the surgery. And now I feel like I've had a hundred of them, um, but it was, it was, it was good. I feel like they took all the precautions to make it feel safe, even though it sort of just felt sketchy in general because of everything that was going on. Um, and as I said, it was sort of nice to have some time to be at home afterward and recover and not be 
too worried about what I was missing because really I wasn't missing anything. Um, I have a friend that owns a little fitness studio here in LA. So I was able to get into the gym to use that in like a private safe atmosphere, which is really nice. And I was also going to physical therapy and they were still doing that during the pandemic, just with masks and face shields. And it wasn't quite as hands-on as um, PT sometimes can be um, just because of everything that was going on. But, um, but it was good. And then I, I, uh, went to Europe when all the national teams went to train uh, in Switzerland and Sosfe in October. Um, but it wasn't the most productive for me because it was kind of a little bit soon after surgery still. And so I was only able to do a few runs a day and kept it pretty mellow, but it was still nice to be able to test it out. And that's kind of like my only regret for this last year and everything is that I had this issue with my knee and they basically told me that there was a bigger procedure that I could have and actually fix the problem. Um, and I had had the same procedure on my other knee in 2015, but um, it's like a nine month recovery and I didn't want to do it in July um, when it was proposed because I was super nervous. I was going to miss this season and this is our Olympic qualifying year. And this year has so much importance that I didn't do it and instead did kind of like a placeholder surgery and it was meant to be kind of like a quick fix, but not actually a fix and just kind of remedy the situation, but not fix it. And um, now with everything being canceled, I could have actually gotten the actual surgery and actually fixed my knee and wouldn't have missed any Olympic qualifying events because none of them have happened. But um it's hindsight and there's no point dwelling on it. And the surgery we had, I think will help a little bit. And I've since then got a series of injections called Duralane, which are supposed to help lubricate, lubricate and mitigate, mitigate the uh, joint pain. And we'll see. I mean, hopefully it's good. And after this season, uh, see what other steps I need to take to keep my knee healthy through the Olympics. And then after 2022, I'll definitely have the real surgery that I need and properly fix it. And, We'll probably be done competing anyway, so um, won't have anything to rush back to. So Gus, I obviously know, but uh, maybe not everyone knows. Um, you actually do a lot of work with different organizations. You're um, not, you know, being an activist the way you are. You're also very philanthropic with organizations that are dear to your heart. Um, can you tell us about a few of those and uh, yeah. what you've done with them? Of course. Um I don't know where to start. I mean, yeah, obviously LGBTQ causes are near and dear to my heart and um, have done a lot of stuff in the past with like the Trevor Project, which deals with um, at risk LGBTQ youth at risk of suicide. The rates are much, much higher for gay and lesbian kids as they are for their straight counterparts and transgender kids are exponentially more high risk of suicide. And so it provides a hotline and text service for kids 24 seven to be able to reach out to someone and get help. Um, and we've done fundraising stuff for them. And then I feel like we really got into the philanthropy stuff. I really got into it with the AIDS life cycle. And I had a friend, Dan, who did the ride and I went to see him at the finish line, having previously not really known anything about it and was so moved by it. It's this 545 mile bicycle ride from San Francisco to Los Angeles. It takes like six days, it's like a hundred miles a day. Um, and it's all a fundraiser for um, HIV AIDS and it's through the Los Angeles LGBT Center and the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. And so those centers provide other resources than just those things. They provide um, STI screenings and um, affordable medication to prevent getting HIV like PrEP, Truvada, um, and then also treatment for people that have it. And so it's really an incredible service. And I decided that I was going to do it and I signed up for it. And at the time I was like, oh, I, you know, I have a million followers. So like if all of my followers donated a dollar, we would be able to raise a million dollars. And so that was kind of the goal that I set out for myself. And <laughs> I realized that it's a lot harder to get people to donate than that. Um, and so we spent basically a whole year fundraising and um, did a lot of different stuff. We did some products that we designed, like Smith, my optic sponsor, did a um, pair of cycling glasses. And then we did kits with this, uh, bicycle kits with this company, Angelus Creative. And 
designed all these things, pop sockets that were all um, had a philanthropic component attached to it. Either the proceeds were 100% toward my AIDS life cycle or a large portion of them was. And we ended up setting the record for fundraising for AIDS life cycle. They've been doing it for, I don't even know how long, like 20, 30 years. And um, I think their previous highest uh, fundraiser was like 50 grand or something or 80 grand maybe. And we raised like $260,000 um, for my ride, which was really incredible. And Michael, you know, cause you're, you're on my team, but I had a great team of friends that did the ride with me and um, roped them into it. And it was just a really, really rewarding experience. And I'm still doing that. The ride got canceled and was pushed to a virtual ride, which I actually didn't participate in because I found it was very difficult to fundraise for a virtual thing, but I am looking forward to the next in-person AIDS life cycle whenever it happens. And then this past year, I still wanted to help out. I, I wanted to do something. And so I signed up for Cameo, which I have been insanely reluctant to do and decided to do it with a hundred percent of the proceeds for my cameos going to first responders first for doctors and nurses on the front line of the pandemic. And, um, I charged, I think $150 per cameo and made videos for people. And we raised $20,000 for first responders first. So <laughs> I spent a lot of time <laughs> doing these videos. Um, but it was really cool. And I felt, I felt good and it gave me something to do during the days and, and made me feel like I was doing something to help and, and also raised some money for a very worthy cause. Um, and then during the black lives matter stuff was donating my own money and trying to encourage people to do that on stories and, um, did a virtual, uh, workout class with my friend, Seth, who was also on our life cycle team and who owns the gym that I've been able to train at. And, um, we raised like $5,000 for, um, I believe the okra project. Um, but anyway, it's just like, there's all these amazing causes and, and, and foundations. And I feel like when I find out about them and, and do something for them, then I want to do more and more and more. And I think that's kind of my personality. That's how I am with hobbies, with guitar. It's how I am with skiing. It's how I am in relationships like i'm a little bit of a psycho and i feel like i i don't have i have no chill like it's like zero or a hundred <laughs> um so yeah a lot of these foundations and, and organizations have essentially gone from zero because i didn't know about them to a hundred because i found out about it and i'm all in trying to do as much as i can well, it's pretty amazing too because from day one you've always been involved in a lot of things and and just your ability to transition from doing things in person, like hosting Love Loud and and riding the AIDS life cycle and such, to finding all these other ways to help donate during this time. I think it just proves how even in a pandemic or even when times change, there's still ways to reach out and make a difference. And, and you've done an amazing job with that, without a doubt. I mean, it's been my pleasure to be alongside you in some of these things, and it's been pretty cool. And, and anyone listening, I would definitely, when when the ride is back up and running, the AIDS life cycle, I would look into it. I mean, there's so many people um, in this industry that ride bicycles, and it's not your typical Grand Fondo type of thing or anything, but the, the life experience you could get out of it, I would say, is bar none. Um, we had a couple of other industry folks from Smith and uh, – ride with us and it would and we all agree that it was just uh something when you're done you're 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 happy to be done at the time but then a, a week and two weeks pass and you're kind of like wow you miss the the family i would say wouldn't i mean so anyway, yeah no so it's I, a, I, it's a life-changing experience i would recommend it to anybody and and so many people are like oh my god did you have to train so hard and it's like no like you can do it at your own pace, you can go as slow as you want. There's like 70 year old people on the ride. There are people of every different body shape and size, and you don't have to kill yourself trying to win it. There's no, there's no winning. There's no, no timed aspect. No one cares who gets to the finish line first each day. It's just really like a group thing. And you, uh, I don't know, you get closer with your friends and you end up making new friends. And there's just an incredible level of camaraderie and everyone's there for different reasons and it's really nice yeah it is and i mean a couple of guys on the team barely had what they'd ridden a bike 
20 miles tops in their entire life and they completed the entire 545 miles? Yeah. I mean, my, my first day of AIDS life cycle was my second day on my road bike. Yeah. So between you, um, Matt and Jake, it was pretty, very impressive. Yeah. I mean, Jake wanted to kill himself, but yeah. <laughs> so Gus, big year coming up next 13 months. Uh, obviously, like we talked about, everything's a little bit fluid, but at the same time, I think you have some pretty lofty goals that you want to accomplish. Um, tell us what those are. Um, well, I want to make it to my third Winter Olympics. And I've gone now in 2014 and 2018, and both times was trying to go for half pipe and slope style. And I compete in both those disciplines. And in 2014, I actually earned both my spots and then the US team because there's so many people and there's such a deep level of talent. They um, actually took my spot from me for half pipe and gave it to someone else. And it's called a coach's discretion spot. And they felt like someone else had more metal potential and he had been hurt during the qualifying events, but was going to be healthy for the games. And so it was definitely a pretty tough pill to swallow. Um, but I went to Sochi anyway for slope style and I got a medal. So, uh, I guess it's kind of like all's well that ends well, but it was still very frustrating. And I felt like I had metal potential in my other discipline and didn't get to show it. And so that was tough. And then in 2018, I was trying again and basically like killing myself trying to qualify for both disciplines. And once again, just missed it in half pipe. And I was the number one ranked US skier going into the games. And I think I ended up fifth. Uh, fifth or sixth in half pipe and four is the maximum that can go. So again, I just missed it. Um, and so this time around, um, there is a slightly different qualification process for GB and there's not as deep of a uh, pool of talent. Um, so I feel confident that I'll be able to go for both disciplines and I, I definitely hope to, but actually my focus has shifted to half pipe and I've gone to two games now for slope style and, um, and, gotten the medal and, and didn't do as well in 2018 as I had hoped to at the actual games. And I fell during my run, but I feel like I've had that experience twice in slope style and I haven't got to have it in half pipe. So my goal is making it to the Olympics and competing for GB in half pipe and hopefully also in slope style and big air, which has been added this year. Um, and I'm kind of just trying to take the steps to make that happen. So if we have world cups this year, if we have qualifying events, I want to do well on those. My goal for the beginning of the season was to win the Crystal Globe for FIS, and there's no World Cups this year, so that's not happening. Um, but my goal is just to make it to the Olympics and to be healthy and take care of my knee, and then uh, I want to medal there. I want to get a medal in half pipe and have a medal for each of the disciplines, and so that's, that's my goal, and that's my focus. Um, and yeah, and then wait, was there another part of the question? <laughs> no, that was it so far. Um, okay. But knowing all that too, um, you know, I just want to touch on the fact that um, I know you're trying or we're, we're trying to put together, a, you know, it came up, you had this idea, um, I guess, this summer as well. And so we're trying to put the pieces together to um, document this and actually create a documentary. And, um, yeah. uh, you know, touch on that just a little bit. Cause I know the documentary really wants to tell a different story than everything that you've done, but you know, you've, you've been interviewed, you came out on ESPN, the cover of ESPN and stuff. So it seems like your story has been told, but I know was um, that a lot of people don't know is that there, there's still a lot more to be told. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think I have uh, a pretty interesting story and I think it's, dynamic and there's been a lot of ups and downs and some of those ups and some of those downs have been seen publicly um, and some of them haven't. And I feel like I would love to tell my story and, and really lay it all out there from start to finish, both me getting into skiing and also me kind of coming to terms with myself and coming out and uh, the rewards of that and also the repercussions of all of these different actions and all these things that have happened in my life that have led me to where I am. And I, I think it it, it, it is a compelling story. And I started talking with, with you and with um, my team at WME about it. And it seemed like there was a lot of interest and we have some incredible filmmakers that are attached to it. Um, 
uh, Rob Epstein and Jeffrey Friedman, who won the Academy Award for their work on the Harvey Milk documentary, and obviously are incredibly accomplished filmmakers. And um, I'm really excited to have them help tell the story. And so we're going to try and document this last year leading into the Olympic Games and my final Olympic Games, but then also kind of be cutting back and forth and segueing uh, all these other parts of my stories. Uh, all these other parts of my story that haven't necessarily been told or haven't been told in full. Um, and I'm excited for it. I think it's gonna be really good. And I don't know, I kind of like want something that's, I guess, kind of like my like legacy to leave behind in skiing. And I feel like this documentary could be that. Yeah, no. And I think it would be really cool because I do, you know, me knowing you so well, what's interesting about you, Gus, is that you're, you're a multifaceted human you know, like there's not one thing that makes Gus Kenworthy. So I think that's where a story like this definitely needs to be told because you still have a lot to offer. Speaking of which, after the games, 2022, you're done with Beijing. What will be next? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I would like to pursue acting and I, I got to have a taste of it and I starred in this last season of American Horror Story on FX, which was a dream come true. It was super fun to be on set. And so I would love to try and continue to pursue that. Um, and during the pandemic, I was taking a couple acting classes and trying to kind of hone my skills, but it was sort of a difficult thing to do virtually and um, had a lot of other stuff going on. So it sort of, I guess, kind of fell by the wayside a little bit. And my focus right now is just on skiing. And so I'm trying not to think about too much else, but post Beijing, I would definitely like to try and lean into that a little bit more. And um, and also doing some more hosting stuff. It's, it's something that um, I've had the opportunity to do a little bit of with like NBC's Nightline and Good Morning America and different things that I've gotten to host. And I have this job for the upcoming Summer Olympics with NBC. And I really enjoy doing that and it's fun. And I don't know, I think it could be interesting. So I kind of don't have like a clear cut path in mind, but I'm open to whatever. And I feel like, um, I don't know. I feel like things will happen and I'll land on my feet and I don't know what it'll be, but I'm looking forward to it. Gus, you've actually talked, um, quite a bit about the last year in 2020 and some of the highs and lows. Is there any one particular lesson or a couple of takeaways that you would, you could share with everyone that would be like, this is how, you know, these are the things that I'm going to apply moving forward in my life that definitely can have a positive effect, um, even though it was such a rough time at times. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, I mean, as I said, meditation has been really, really helpful for me. And I feel like um, one of the principles that I've kind of picked up on from meditating is staying in the moment and staying present and also being grateful. And I feel like I have so much to be grateful for. And it's kind of easy to, to spin out uh, with everything that's going on, whether it's politically or socially um, or, or whatever it may be. And I feel like it's, it's kind of easy to dwell on things that got canceled or things that uh, didn't come to fruition or I don't know, are just tough right now. But even with everything that's tough and difficult, I know this sounds super cliche, but there also is always so much to be grateful for. And I feel like whether it's just a little mental list of things that are uh, things that you're appreciative of, whether it's like the fact that it's sunny today or um, the fact that you like have a comfortable bed. And I know it sounds so cliche and like this is like stuff my mom told me as a kid and I would roll my eyes at her, but like it actually does, um, it kind of, lightens the load a little bit and it makes you feel, at least for me, it makes me feel a lot better. And I feel like during this year, I realized the importance of relationships, both friendships and, and family relationships and my romantic relationship. And I feel like that is something that, uh, I guess I sort of always knew, but I feel like this year being isolated for so much of the year, um, like checking in on friends and having people check in on me, it, it goes a long way. And so I feel like it's like strengthened a lot of relationships and made me realize how important so many people are to me. 
and that I want to put in the work to maintain those relationships and nurture those relationships because, um, because they bring me so much joy and they're, they're so important. I kind of feel like that is truly what life is about is about, um, making connections and, and nurturing them and, and allowing them to grow and, and allowing people to be there for you and, and really showing up for them whenever you can. I couldn't agree more. I feel like gratitude has become such a big part of my life and the relationships that I've garnered in this last year and the relationships that I've had, but the same thing, it's like focusing in on the things that matter. And, and I feel like there's a lot of people that have done that. So uh, it's something that hearing it from you too, it just re reinforces in me. And I'd also, I would also recommend adopting a dog. That also was a good thing too. <laughs> and I know you're a big fan of adoption. So yeah, I am for sure. I'm looking at my dog right now. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I, I already had my dog, but that, that definitely is a saving grace and something I would encourage anybody to do if they have the, the means and the, uh, environment to do so. Yeah. I mean, that was kind of a big mark that you made back in 2014. So it's, you know, I think you've had a huge impact on a lot of people and hopefully you can continue to do that as well with dog adoption. Well, thanks. If anybody wants to name their dog Gus, you can. It's a dog name. I, I feel like people always tell me that it's their dog's name. I'm like, okay. Well, thank you for your time. Um, this has been great. And uh, any, anyone else that you want to thank or anything um, before we uh, sign off here? And thank you for letting us into your home. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank Michael Spencer um, for the kind words and the interview and for dealing with my shit every day uh and my mom it's perfect <laughs>